Thank you for uh, whoever is interested in uh, putting a price point on carbon for attending the session because it's something that I'm quite passionate about and have been so for, well, uh, most of my career. Um, and so just to uh, um, get this going, uh, this gentleman here, former Congressman Costello, uh, and I'll let you tell a little bit about yourself and, and um, your service to our great country, but also uh, how, how it's happening in the uh, federal uh, sector. And then uh, this gentleman is, is uh, very uh, con uh, versant in, uh, in the state, the situation in, in all 50 states regarding, uh, regarding pricing carbon. But I just want to start this with a little story. So in, in 2010, I was invited to a meeting uh, at the Dirksen Senate building where uh, John Kerry and uh, Barbara Boxer came in carrying Nancy Pelosi's bill that she had just got through Congress, and that was uh, called cap and trade. We might all remember that. So there was a lot of hope then back uh, around 2010 um, to, to actually get a price point uh, on carbon, and it was a value on these invisible gases. What happened was, according to, well, depending on who you talk to, that, um, uh, that and, and they said they were going to get together with their colleague on the other side of the aisle, Lindsey Graham, and they were going to get this bill through the Senate and then put, a, uh, put it on the president's desk to be signed. And we all know that the president gets his first bill generally, you know, um, through. And, uh, and that um, I heard that Rahm Emanuel blocked that, and that it was a fight that, that they weren't willing to have, the White House wasn't willing to have with the fossil fuel industry. And conversely, I also heard... Uh, from Nancy Pelosi, actually, that, uh, that in fact, uh, Lindsay had um, backed out and thrown it under the bus. I don't know what happened, but we missed a moment in time nine years ago when we could have sent a message to the world that the United States of America, which produces fully 25% of the world's emissions annually uh, and has the lion's share up there, by the way, because that stuff is up there for 100 and some of it 1,000 years, um, we could could have sent a message to the world that we were serious on pricing carbon. So I just want to open up this conversation um, uh, with that, with these gentlemen, uh, and, and, and with the caveat that uh, at that time, some alternatives were put on the table. Senator Cantwell from Washington got together with uh, Senator Snow, and they had a cap and dividend, which every American was going to get some money in the mail, like up in Alaska from the oil uh, dividends, and that was going to be an incentivizer. Um, and since then, um, there's been a lot of different initiatives um, uh, trying to push this through. So why don't we start on the federal side with the former congressman and, and tell us, you know, from your perspective, what is happening uh, 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 today uh, in, the, in the nine years that have ensued since that moment? Sure. Uh, thank you for having me here. My name is Ryan Costello. I served two terms in <clears throat> Congress. One, my, my first term, uh, President Obama's last two years in office, my second term, President Trump's first two years in office, I served on the Transportation Committee and then the Energy and Commerce Committee, which does have jurisdiction largely over energy policy and more specifically uh, why we're here to, uh, what we're here to talk about today, uh, the issue of climate change and how to properly address it. Um, I serve, I'm a consultant in Washington, D.C. I'm Managing Director at Americans for Carbon Dividends. Americans for Carbon Dividends is the 501c4 for the Climate Leadership Council. We have a specific plan, uh, clc.org. I'm not going to deep uh, dig in the weeds on that plan here today, but the gist of it, uh, and to be responsive um, to what is happening in Washington, D.C., is that carbon pricing is solution in order to drive down dramatically carbon emissions reductions in this country and for America to be a global leader on this issue. Now, carbon pricing at $42 per metric ton, which would then be evaluated on an annual basis to look at how um, effective carbon emissions reductions are happening so that we know if they're, what the escalator on that price would be um, is one piece of it. The revenue would go back to the American taxpayer, hence I use the term pricing and not the three-letter word that starts with T and ends with X. Um, the other element of that, and I'm going to get into some other uh, pieces of legislation out there broadly momentarily, the other piece of the 
Um, it's called the Baker Schultz Carbon Dividends Plan. The other piece of that plan is regulatory simplification. And what that is, is, is that for a carbon price, with the dividend going back to the American taxpayer, there is not additional regulations in the carbon dioxide space moving forward. That gives industry a price signal that they have to deal with for carbon pollution, but they know what the cost is going to be, and you're not going to be dealing with additional regulations. I would also make the argument that we saw what the Trump administration did in response to the Clean Power Plan, and what happens when you have a federal bureaucratic response, whether it's from Democrats or from Republicans, is it ends up in court for a long time. And then a new administration comes in, and they just do what they want to do. And the regulations don't have the impact that they may have been in intended to have. And the cost of those regulations is much, much higher and much less efficient than were there to be carbon pricing. There are some other carbon pricing uh, bills um, that have been introduced. Some have a lower uh, starting point uh, per metric ton, uh, but escalate much higher. Many, most if not all of them actually, the, the, real chain, the real difference between that and the CLC.org proposal, the Carbon uh, Schultz uh, Dividends Plan, is that the revenue is used for infrastructure or used to pay down the debt or used to uh, uh, additional climate measures, whatever the case may be. Those are the differences. You're seeing a couple Republicans come sign on to those bills. A lot of Democrats are on many of those bills. There's a debate on the right on whether to be for carbon pricing. There's a debate on the left on whether carbon pricing is enough or whether they should even venture into carbon pricing because they need something more dramatic a la Green New Deal. Um, but I think the main point that I want to conclude with here at the outset is that the issue of climate change and the fact that something needs to get done is now a a kitchen table discussion in the Republican conference. It is not as far reaching as what is happening in the, in the Democratic caucus, but it is happening and we are seeing that the cost of climate impacts us, our health, agriculture, insurance, um, right on down the line in addition to, uh, I think was a really great explanation by uh, a gentleman up here momentarily about all the different ways that the impact of climate has, not just in the American economy and us as a as American citizens, but across the globe in migration patterns, et cetera, et cetera. So look forward to the discussion, and thanks for having me. You bet. So that frames a little bit on the, on the federal side. Now, if we can get into the, uh, the states, uh, you know, 50 states, uh, we have a nation, um, as uh, uh, Andrew pointed out the other day, that, that um, you know, uh, really uh, it's, it's sort of you need 50 opinions to figure out something because each state is, is, is running itself. So what, what is happening at the level uh, uh, of the governor, of the governors, uh, of the um, perhaps the state PUCs, I think, are probably involved in this conversation in the utilities. Sure, uh, and thanks for having me. My name is Jonah Kerman Faber. I am a research associate and consultant at Climate Exchange. Our specialty is carbon pricing, and I use that term generally. It's not necessarily tax. It's not necessarily cap and trade. It's an umbrella term at the state level. And we do that in a variety of ways. It's at the nexus, really, of media advocacy and also uh, numbers-based research. And my role there is to get on the phone with legislators, fly out to states, provide them a technical assistance to improve the effectiveness of the carbon pricing bills they're putting forward, and also through our state carbon pricing network, which has recently grown to over 1,500 members across 45 states, to use the state movements for carbon pricing as a movement to connect them to build towards larger federal and eventually global policy, because that is an important aspect of state movement as well. Now, before we get into some of the state thing, I think it's really important to reiterate the importance of carbon pricing as this central policy solution for everything we've talked about today, whether that be the hydrogen economy or all these amazing new energy efficiency uh, ideas that I've never even heard of before today. All of those uh, can be profoundly impacted and influenced by a upstream signal uh, on carbon pricing. Uh, this has the ability to spur significant uh, market innovation, uh, has profound impacts on the stock market even, uh, and there's a lot of uh, hidden ways in which this carbon price works which we tend not to think about. 
Um, the second thing I think it's important to reiterate really quick is that the price needs to be real. It needs to be substantial. You know, the uh, interagency working group on social costs of carbon back in 2016 calculated for this year a carbon price of around $52 when adjusted to 2019 inflation. Uh, that estimate can go up as high as 417, some go up as high as $800. Um, the Stern Stiglitz, the Stern -Stiglitz high, uh, high Commission on Carbon Pricing uh, recommends a price of $40 to $80 per metric ton by 2020, assuming complementary policy going up to 50 to 200 by 2030. Raise your hand if in your jurisdiction or market or whatever uh, sector you work in, a price of 40 to $80 next year would have an impact on the way you do business and how you'd plan for the future. So we're getting around a third to a half, all right? And now this is, this is an important thing to bring up, is that carbon pricing is one part of the solution it is not the entire thing, but it is the central solution that economists agree upon. Now, moving on to the state movements. Uh, states are moving on this. I think it's really important to recognize that there is progress while federal action lags. We had 16 states propose bills last year. There was uh, 30, pl 30 plus bills in total. Uh, we had executive orders, co especially coming out of New Mexico. Uh, and. Um, we have the Transportation Climate Initiative coming out of the Northeast, a lot of the regional greenhouse gas initiative states. And we have cap and trade programs like California, Quebec's uh, linked Western Climate Initiative program and the regional greenhouse gas initiative program moving forward and expanding with New Jersey joining uh, next year. So I think it's while, we're, while we have this discussion of the tension between uh, you know, I think Ryan encapsulated well that the right is having this uh, discussion over whether carbon pricing is to be a part of their platform, and this discussion on the left on a similar vein, although they're from different angles, uh, we are seeing actual states moving on this. Now, that does not mean that there's still massive challenges. Um, some of you may be aware of Oregon having 11 senators uh, um, flee the state in protest of their cap and trade bill which was years in the making and fairly rigorously uh, uh, researched economically. Virginia, meanwhile, their governor pulled out of the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative at the last minute to the shock of environmental groups who have been working on this for years. So this is still a very contentious battleground and still has partisan challenges that organizations like Climate Exchange are, are looking to combat. However, we do consider the states to be some of a testing ground where we can prove these concepts, which are rigorously verified through economic and environmental research, uh, to set the stage for federal, federal policy later on. Great, and you know, really, um, I think it's in all of our interest to, to take this conversation and use it as a platform to discuss how it is that we're going to uh, unite a, a very divided country. So how can we, take uh, pricing carbon uh, and, uh, and use that as a, a mechanism to get um, uh, Republicans talking to uh, Democrats, to get red states talking to blue states in some sort of a, um, a, a unified way. Uh, you want to take a, a swing at that? I, I think first and foremost, having the business community lean in um, to Republican elected officials in particular is extremely important. Uh, a, a lot of the, let's just be honest, a lot of the validators of climate change and the cost of climate um, come from sources that, that don't traditionally find themselves supporting Republicans, um, at least from the advocacy wing. But when you, have, when you have a company saying, listen, this is, let's just I'll give you a good example, like probably the best example. Um, would be a farmer saying, listen, th the amount of land that I'm able to farm and the duration of my farming uh, season is shrinking as a consequence of it being more dry or being too flooded or whatever the case may be. Um, and that's a result of what's happening. And why, the reason that it's happening is that we are having increased carbon dioxide, which is capturing heat and causing more torrential downpours and more extreme weather patterns and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, it is much harder for a Republican elected official when their constituent, who is a you know, reliably, I don't want to say all farmers are Republicans, but a reliably Republican voter saying, listen, this is happening, sir, I need, or ma'am, I need your 
help looking into this. Um, so I think who the messengers are to Republicans is extremely important on the issue of how to um, create critical mass and a sense of urgency behind the issue. I think for Democrats, uh, particularly uh, more center-oriented uh, Democrats, um, looking at what more progressive Democrats may want to propose for a centrist Democrat to say, that's not the art of the possible, um, but carbon pricing is something that, that makes sense, that would work, that would economically work. It's a price signal. Um, it, is, it, is, it is a free market-based application of policy that, will, that can demonstrably drive down carbon emissions, and you then have industry uh, continuing to invest in technologies that will remove carbon or incentivize more renewable options that will, it, it will become a cheaper choice um, than a carbon emitting option. Um, that speaks to a lot of Americans. And then you, what you're having are center right elected officials who see that we have a problem and want a solution, but they want a solution that isn't just a, another government mandate. And you have center-left elected officials who know that what the more progressive wing of the party would do, uh, but don't see that as possible, and say, OK, what's the alternative to that? And then you have a center-left, center-right coalition that's trying to do good with industry. I think if you don't have industry at the table in a constructive way, this is not going to work. I mean, that's just not how the American system of government works, ever. And so as a consequence, you're creating you know, the stools of this chair that you can build something with in a very meaningful fashion with, with a set of policies that are people going to criticize it? Yes, of course. That's what policy making in a, in a democracy is. But they're going to be criticizing something that's tangible, that's tested, that has economists saying this will work, that industry is saying not only will it work, but we, we, we know how to deal with it from a marketplace perspective, from a goods and services and product delivery perspective, from an employment perspective, um, then you can have opinion writers. And there's a lot of um, editorial pages that are supportive of the plan that, I, that I've been working on and, and other carbon uh, pricing plans. That's how, you, that's how you do it. And that's how we're trying to do it. Um, but it takes, it takes not only buy-in from a lot of different constituencies, it takes compromise from a lot of different constituencies and compromise in a highly polarized environment where folks don't see something happening in the next nine months or 12 months or two years. Um, compromise is hard to get when they don't see something happening right away. I'll finish the answer with this quote. And I don't know if somebody said this or I saw it on Twitter or both. People tend to overestimate what can happen in a year but they tend to underestimate how much can actually happen in four or five years. And so if you're going to do something really big and really ambitious and really meaningful on an issue this complex and sophisticated, is it going to happen in a year? No. But it could happen a lot sooner with a lot more buy-in from a lot more politicians um, sooner than we might realize. Thank you. Um, can we get a couple of mics uh, in the room? I want to get, there's some really smart people in here that have been thinking about this issue for a long, long time. And I want to get some uh, Q&A going. But, but before we go that, and while they're getting the mics positioned, you know, with the mic runners, um, you know, just comment on, you know, so Paul Pullman, who just stepped down from running Unilever, uh, you know, he's been a real, uh, uh, one of the, the real progressive thinkers as a, the head of a big multinational corporation that is looking at carbon through the lens of, uh, you know, let's call it um, uh, supply line economics, where they're internalizing the price of carbon. And they realize, as Amory has said so many times, there's more money to be made in saving energy than there is in producing it. Right. And that actually directly goes to the, to the bottom line. So in lieu of, of having a, 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 a federal um, price on carbon in the United States or, or even in the various states, um, you know, the com big companies have been internalizing this voluntarily, I think, right? So uh, maybe you can speak to that a little bit, and then I'd like to go to some Q&A if we could. 
Sure. So uh, one thing comes to mind is a study that came out, I believe, last week or two weeks ago that investigated Washington. And Washington State is a really interesting case study because they've had multiple different proposals on carbon pricing of different designs over the past few years. And uh, so two interesting, actually, it was two studies. One was on the stock market side and speaks to your point about internal pricing that found that even fairly modest proposals in terms of the price signal with returning the revenue back to uh, um, households and businesses had profound shifts in the stock market when it came to carbon intensive uh, companies. I think that's a really radical point, uh, important point to make. Um, the second study that recently came out in Washington was around ideology. And it's a fairly obvious point, but one that requires research to really back up is that the ideology around how revenue is spent is dictating how these programs, how these policies play out in terms of their political uh, landscape. So in a place like Washington, the car as Benji highlighted earlier, the carbon dividend, uh, the ca um, carbon price and dividend uh, plan that was proposed was opposed by uh, more uh, left of center um, advocates. Meanwhile, there are other states where we're actually finding left of center advocates opposing market-based uh, policies altogether. And so at Climate Exchange, and this is a little off point from what you were bringing up with the companies, but I think it's important to backtrack on, on what was said before, is that we emphasize that different states are gonna require different solutions. And the central components of carbon pricing, the profound impact of a price itself, is a moment of consensus for these groups. And then you can flexibly design the program to maintain its impact while catering to the ideologies or the political landscape of a given state. Thank you. Okay, so some questions out there. Uh, I see, uh, how about we'll start over here on this side of the room. Can we get a mic over to Bill uh, from the uh, uh, Presidential Climate Action Project? Thank you. This is primarily for Representative Costello, and by the way, thank you for your work putting together the Climate Solutions Caucus in the House when you were there. There's two things I wanted to bring up. The poison pill that a lot of people see in the Baker Schultz proposal is it exempting ExxonMobil, Shell, and other large oil companies from liability lawsuits, uh, which I think uh, the proposal would be a lot more popular if that exemption wasn't in there. It seems to be a payoff. Second thing is, had anyone considered taxing the carbon footprint of these fuels rather than the carbon content, meaning all the carbon produced over the life cycle of these fuels um, rather than just when they're burned? Uh, second question first, I will answer them both. Uh, that is, would require, a, uh, I can't answer the question whether that was considered, <laughs> but I could say to you that that would be even more difficult than putting a price on um, carbon output, which is itself an extremely difficult thing to do and imperfect and not categorically captured. Uh, second, your other question uh, related to um, liability. Um, I think that you will, you, you know, you'll see uh, some additional commentary on that in the weeks, uh, months ahead. Um, I, I think that um, the best answer that I could give you at the moment is that that discussion will probably have some more um, uh, statements to come in, in the weeks and months ahead. Um, and it was, uh, it's a, that's probably the best way I should answer that for now. Gentleman over here. Thank you. Uh, Greg Hamra, Citizens Climate Lobby and Business Climate Leaders. Thanks for the work you're both doing. Uh, Congressman Ryan, to your left. Hi. Huh. Um, <clears throat> many climate hawks and economists are in agreement that on one hand, we have solutions, which is what this beautiful conference is about. It's about solutions. And on the other hand, you have policy that would lift the boot off the neck of those solutions by making the price of dirty energy honest, thereby making the price honest as well, uh, the, so that the price tag tells the truth about what's good or bad for society. So I simply want to ask those on the panel, under what scenario would we expect to see market actors divert trillions in capital away from dirty energy and redirect it into clean energy and low carbon solutions while dirty energy remains the cheapest? I mean, I think that's the, the crux of the matter. Um, and, you know, I could, I, I, I could even frame it a little bit differently. 
uh, I was looking somewhere a little bit ago on, you know, why is our transportation system, why is our public transit so woeful and antiquated relative to European public transit systems? Well, the answer is when they were built. And so we have these st stranded assets, right, in the tr public transportation sector, in the energy sector that continue to exist and persist because we have investments that are just sunk there. And so until we look at a market signalization for what the true cost of the output of that energy is relative to health, agriculture, insurance, right on down the line, uh, national security, until it, uh, emergency fun, uh, funding. We spend more, I mean, every single year, I think I was there, we, sp we had a supplemental for between 50 and 100 billion dollars for disaster relief. That, that question you just asked, fortunately there is extensive economic analysis to help support that question. And that question of what's it gonna take to move trillions of dollars uh, towards a, uh, you know, a just green economy, that it's gonna take a price signal. And that price signal has to be substantial. And I think it's also important to realize that we're not talking about some incremental change that you know, on a year basis, as Ryan beautifully put, substantive change might happen over four or five years. In this case, we have been years to make the substantial uh, change we need. That's really empowering because that makes us, uh, that allows us to use something like a market-based mechanism, a carbon price, effectively because it has enough time to prol proliferate throughout the market. Yes, there are stranded assets, especially in the U United States. That becomes a huge problem, especially at the state level. You know, the conversations we have with these states, um, often what comes up is, I'm a small state, why would I act on climate change? I'm just imposing costs on my constituents to solve a global problem that I am a small contributor to. And, and, and incidentally, um, you, you have another consideration for some of these, let's call them stranded assets. With the price signalization, who's to say that there's not technology that will take that stranded asset or actually cheaper production of energy that is more pol polluting, uh, remove the pollutant, and make that a more competitive asset? That's one answer to the question. And then the uh, one thing to, to consider. And then the other thing is that's just going to drive more innovation into the space of um, not only not uh, utilizing as much energy or utilizing it differently, um, but having a lot of these larger companies invest more and more and more in R&D because they know what the cost is and they're going to be able to do the math a lot easier. And what, what any employer will tell you, what capitalism thrives on is certainty. Tell me what it costs. If you tell me what it costs, I'll figure it out. And that's what this does. This is central, which I believe mirrors it's a great the point. opening comments of this uh, this conference today. Great. Well, uh, we, we're down to uh, just over one minute is uh, give each gentleman uh, a concluding remark and uh, it has really to do with how we can, uh, in, in a worldwide economy that's uh, $80 trillion GDP, all 196 countries in, that's based primarily on the extraction of uh, oil, coal, and gas to drive that, how are we going to get there? and the time necessary. And uh, this is uh, gonna be a uh, flash round, so you know you got uh, 30 seconds. If we do not do that, if we are, do not lead, then China and India will continue to lead. They will, be, they will create more jobs, create more patents. They will be leading on something that we should lead on. Um, CLC.org is the plan that I'm supportive of. I think my email address is in my bio, so if anybody wants to follow up with subsequent discussions, I'm happy to talk. I enjoy coming to these sorts of conferences, and I appreciate all of the, the lot. I know everyone was paying attention. I didn't see anybody on their phone for this. Usually when I speak, there's a couple people doing this, but thank you for paying so close attention and, and um, you know, doing the work that all of you do respectively in the field. Thank you, Congressman, and uh, you have the last word. Uh, we'll take an extra couple seconds. To mirror Ryan's points, 57 countries now, 57 uh, jurisdictions, national jurisdictions, uh, I'm sorry, 46 national jurisdictions have carbon pricing programs scheduled or implemented, 57 programs total. U.S. is falling behind, states are falling behind. I think Ryan put it most eloquently that we have an opportunity to lead here, otherwise we will perish. 
Thank you so much. Uh, let's put a price on carbon.